Ryan Forehand Kelly. Uh, you know, there are there are there's a handful of people in the organization that when I'm when I'm walking down a hallway somewhere in an arena and and they're coming the other way, coming toward you, that I genuinely get excited to see. And Ryan Forehand Kelly is one of those guys. <laughs> um you have that way about you, Ryan. Right back at you. Um I, I know, thank you. I know it's not something that's that's put on because it's it's natural and i would imagine that's that's a part of your being able to stick around in the organization and connect to the players as you had because there's a there's a natural warmth about you has anyone ever told no, you i'm a, i'm gonna take it as a compliment um but no nobody said warmth so then nobody ever told me that man. they say i'm cold they say i'm like a new yorker now that other on the east coast <laughs> it didn't take yeah it no. You are originally from Long Beach, California, and I know you kind of went back and forth between Southern California and Northern California. Are are you just sort of a of a? Uh, do you call all of California? Home? Yeah, I just say California guy. So I was born in Long Beach. I moved to the Bay when I was three. Uh, I moved back to Southern California, Orange County, when I was uh, like middle of my junior year of high school. So I was like seventeen, and then you know went back to the Bay for college. Went to Berkeley. Um, and then been all over the place from there. So yeah, if you ask me where I'm from, I would just say California. The Golden there State. You go. Um you, you got a you got a hyphen in your yes, forehand Kelly. Um uh, and, and I know a lot of times that that's probably a good family story. So what what are the reasons for the hyphen? Who's forehand? Who's strength, man? It comes down to strength, man. So uh you know, uh forehand is my mother's side. Um and Kelly is my father's side. So, you know, the the idea was to have both names there, you know, because um, that's who I am. You know, strength comes from both sides. And, uh, and you know, it, 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 it's actually kind of fitting. You know, my, my grandfather on my mother's side, you know, he was an orphan, um, you know, made it, made it through, you know, became a doctor. Um, and then, you know, my grandfather on my father's side, you know, he was, he was an entrepreneur. So he, you know, his grandfather was a slave. So, um, you know, he, they're from, the, they're from Oklahoma, Arkansas. And, um, you know, he moved his way out West, built a family and became an entrepreneur, had his own trucking business and whatnot. Um, so I don't know how they foresaw all that. My parents, my mom and dad, but somehow, you know, that was kind of the, the strength in my family. That's kind of what makes me and, and really my brother. You have one brother yeah. and, and forehand is the, is your mom. Right. Kelly is your dad's side. And, and, and that's, it's great because that's when I see two names, you know, including both names, the, the mom's maiden name, the father's maiden name. I knew, I knew there was a story behind it. I knew there was something there. Right. Um, your, what was the reason you guys kept going back and forth in, in California? Uh, really school. My mom was in school. My parents had me when they were young. My mom was in school. So she was, uh, uh, you know, she was at UCI, she was at Santa Cruz and then she came back to UCI to get her master's and her PhD. So that's why I moved back. I went to three years of high school in the Bay and then one year of high school in Southern California, a year and a half in, in Southern California. So, um, yeah, it was really because of school education. Your basketball journey will take you all over the world. So I would imagine be, having to go back and forth and leaving friends and meeting new people along the way when you're a kid and you're in grammar school and you're in high school, um, in a way, was that preparing you for everything that was to come in this journey? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know, know it until I had kids and my kids were moved from California to, uh, to the East Coast, to New York and then to Jersey. Um, but to me, that just kind of see what you do. Like you just, your family packs up and you go and you live here and you make new friends and you keep your old friends. And uh, I I looked at it as a blessing. You know, now I got five cities full of friends, you know, so five times the amount of friends, you know, but I didn't really know how, how rare that was really, you know, until I have my own kids and you got to start thinking about, you know, different schools and, you know, going from grammar school to middle school, middle school to high school, uh, different athletic programs, whatever it is, you know. So um, it absolutely did. I mean, 
you know, my 13 years of playing, you know, took me all the way around the world, all kinds of different places and, and whatnot. So uh, it definitely prepared me for that. And, you know, just think about, you You, you just mentioned you, your wife, Melly, you have three kids, you're, you're living in New Jersey now. The life of a coach, the life of a professional basketball player, you know, it it's a nomadic life a lot of times. And you have to account for your family and being a part of that and being able to, you know, have them taking them from one place to another. Uh, before we get into into that aspect of your life let's just go back now to um you're a kid was basketball a way to connect with friends and was that kind of the common language that was spoke whether you were in orange county or you were up in the bay area yeah i mean basketball always kind of been my thing i mean you know it was just me and my brother um so you know we played basketball every day right and you know you go back to like stories when i was like an infant and they'll tell you like if you gave me a ball, I'm trying to shoot it in the lampshade or the trash basket, whatever's around, you know what I'm saying? So uh, it just always been my thing. We played all sports, but basketball kind of, you know, stood out stood out at the end of the day. I mean, we played baseball, football, soccer, all that coming through. Um, but basketball was always kind of the, kind of the way. And that's why I feel blessed to, you know, still be making friendships and relation, you know, building relationships through basketball. Was was uh, Cal always on your your radar? You ended up being a walk on there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your mom uh, has advanced degrees, and education is probably important to you. Cal is uh, that's a that's a good school. So was that always the 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 focal point for you going forward? With that, uh, yes, no, and maybe probably. So, uh, <laughs> all right, all, all three. three. So I, you know. Growing up in the Bay, I was in high school in the Bay, middle school in the Bay. So, you know, I watched a lot of Cal basketball. They were good then. I, you know, it's Jay Kidd, Kevin Johnson when I was younger, Sharif Abdul Rahim. Um, you know, I so I watched all these I watched all these guys play. So I always wanted to go to Cal. You know, and the Pac Ten was crazy back then. I mean, um top five teams in the Pac Ten were, you know, some of the best teams in the country. So I always, I always watched it, you know, as I got a little older in high school, I used to go play with those guys, go to open gym at Cal, whatnot. Um, so as a younger dude like Cal, I always wanted to go to Cal. My godmother went to Cal, um, and, you know, I always wanted to go to Cal. While was, high school went on and reality kicked in and I got older, like, I wasn't sure how real that reality was. I, I was getting recruited by a lot of D1 schools, uh, smaller schools, mid-level schools. Uh, we looked at Ivy League schools, um, some high levels, you know, uh, Division two schools and whatnot. Um, and then Cal came along. Cal came along. At the time, we were sanctioned, so we were down um, one, I think, one scholarship when I got there. Um, and so the deal was, you know, I could go there, but I would I would have to walk off right after I heard my way onto the team. So, um it was a tough decision. It was kind of a risky decision. You know, I had people telling me, coaches telling me, hey, go to Division Two where you'll play. You know, if you go to this Division One, even if you make the team, you'll never play in the Pac-10, this, that, and the other. Um, respect to my brother and mom, I never saw it that way. So I saw it as an opportunity. Um, you know, she raised us to always compete in anything that we do. So, you know, whether that's education or that's sports, and in fact, education coming first. So um, if we didn't compete in education, we were playing no sport. So uh, I wanted to go to a school that had the best of both worlds, right? Like some someone that has an elite education and elite athletics. Um, and so to me, it was a no-brainer. Cal was a no-brainer. And so you're talking scholarship, non-scholarship. Uh, you could call me naive at the time or, or whatever, but that's just money, right? Like, we can go get some more money and we can pay it back. Worst comes to worst, you know, we'll get some money and we'll pay it back. So it was never a financial thing, you know. Now I look back on it, it was kind of a roll of the dice, but uh, but uh, not really because the experience there was exactly that, you know, a tremendous experience educationally, uh, you know, being around students that are in the top of their class, uh, competing at education, like how we compete at basketball. So I'll never forget my... My roommate, my freshman year, Reggie Jacob, was a economics major, and 
he was our team manager. And one night after the game, he got up at like, you know, one thirty two in the morning, we're in the dorms and he, he's getting up. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Bro, he just got home from the game and ate and, um, he's going to like a, a, a study hall, like a, you know, with his classmates, he's going to study cause they have a test. And I'm like, at two 30, bro, you about to go right now at two 30. And he was like, yeah, that's what we do. You know, so they had, you know, they went to the library and they met and they studied from like 2.30 to like 5. But that really opened my eyes. You know, I do that for basketball. You know what I'm saying? And it's like all these kids were doing that for education. So it was a special place to to learn. Um, It's home to me. You know what I'm saying? And then basketball was a very high level, like I said. UCLA, Arizona, Oregon. Uh, you can go all the way down the list, man. It was a super high level of basketball. And, and a great history of basketball there. Like you mentioned, former net great Jason Kidd, of course, uh, went there for your. Who was the coach when you were at Cal? Uh, ben Brown. And he ended up giving you a scholarship the next year, right? You're, you, you earned the scholarship yes. after your freshman year. Yeah. Uh, and eventually you went from being a walk on to being the captain of the team. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I was just a like old, older guy. So I think that's why they gave it to me. But yeah. <laughs> No, I think you're downplaying it. I think your 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 humility is hitting is kicking in there. Did, was there an NBA dream during your years at Cal? Um, what was your what was your your thought about playing professionally when you were at Cal? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, obviously the NBA was obviously the goal, right? Like, um, but to me, more so was just reach my full potential in this game, right? Like that's all you can do, whether it's NBA overseas um whatever it is so uh you know i ended up playing overseas for a long time took a couple cracks at the nba through the d league and the d league back then um but uh you know ultimately 13 years you know we got four championships in this 13 years i i, I left with no regrets so well you, you mentioned the d league so you you that's just a, a little sliver of your your post-college playing career, you had uh, two seasons, I believe, the L.A. Defenders. You're out in L.A., of course, stay in California. Um, 81 games, you averaged about 14 points a game. Um, never maybe quite broke through to the NBA level, level. but I've, I've got to go through. You leave Cal. I mean, now you start this journey. So I'm going to go through the countries you played in. Maybe, sure. Let me know if I'm leaving any right. out. Um Venezuela, right. which you went you went to a, a number of different times yep. in your career. Uh, Japan, China, uh, France, uh, Jordan. Yeah, that was in there. A little bit of Jordan. Yep. Um, am I missing? A, am I missing a country? China. China. We said you say China. All right, China twice. I was there four years, so you can say it four times. Um, uh. <laughs> I think the only one is Croatia, and maybe Italy too. Croatia and in Italy, and Croatia. All right. I had a I had a I had a buddy of mine that played in that went he, you know after college went down to play in Venezuela. That's a place you went a few times, yeah. and he lasted like a week because he said as soon as I saw guys walking around with machetes, I said I was out of there. It's it's a different vibe. You got to get used to. Um, how did you adjust? Is that you? I think that was your first Venezuela might have been your first stop, right? Yeah. So when I came out of college, uh, I was actually about to, to to go to training camp, and then I had surgery. So I had surgery. I ended up, you know, getting healed up from that and whatnot. And it was like this time of year. So I went and played in the playoffs in Margarita Island in Venezuela. Um, and you know, it's kind of inter- introduction to Venezuela because we're on the island. You know, you could compare it to our Hawaii, maybe. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little bit different than, you know, the other two years I played in Caracas, which is, you know, city life. That's that's very different. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it was beautiful. Venezuela was be- beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Just in terms of the lifestyle, uh, you know, the food, um, the basketball was good, competitive, you know, get was is it was it as good as you thought maybe? I mean, you come from the Pac-12. I mean, I'm sure it's kind of like, well, I had my thoughts on I could be an NBA player one time and maybe some injuries, of, and now I'm in Venezuela. Kids, you know, kids in Orange County don't dream about going to play in Venezuela one yeah. day. 
So when you get there, what's the game like? Uh, competitive, rough, uh, but a good brand of basketball at the end of the day. And, you know, they got dudes that can play. I mean, I played against, you know, Victor David Diaz. He was a beast, right? He, he, uh, he low key changed the, the plight of my career because, you know, he was whooping me that, that first year out. I thought I could do something. He was, he was murdering. Me. So I, I worked every single day to be able to compete against him. Uh, that's that same year too. I played with Carl Herrera, uh, you know, who won championship in Houston. Right. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, you know, some good, some good players out there, but it was, it was a very competitive league. Um, they love basketball out there. Um, so it was, you know, to say the least, it was fun. You know, the weather's beautiful. It's nice. It was kind of a summer. It started like in February. It kind of went to like right before the summer. So it was, you know, during these good months. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was, it was a good competitive lady. Uh, I have fun in this way. I, I did a lot of NBA Europe games and, and things like that. And, and I've seen, you know, you mentioned Croatia. I mean, some of the, it gets, it get it gets unruly sometimes. I mean, there's a passion yeah. with the fans. What's the, what's the craziest environment you ever played in? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, each one is crazy in its own sense, man. I mean, uh, if you look at Venezuela, um, you know, I was there when the president passed, right? I, I was there and the president passed and there was like a six week stall in the season. That was crazy. And yeah, you know, everybody's very passionate. So you go to somebody else's home and they're passionate, you know what I'm saying? Well, same thing in Europe though. Same thing in Italy. Like you go play in these teams in Italy or you go from Italy to another country. And, um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's a high level. I mean, it's borderline hate, you know what I'm saying? For you, for your color. I'm saying, um, Wow. Um, so, you know, Croatia too. Passionate, fan. passionate fan, yeah. fan bases. Croatia was crazy too. Um, you know, just with the history there, formerly Yugoslavia, and play, you know, playing against the neighboring countries and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's all passion and and love for their team. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was exciting. It makes it all that much more exciting, you know, to go there and compete. Yeah, and you're getting this incredible experience, not only in basketball, but in life. What about the Asian countries? What what was what was uh it like playing in, in both Japan and China? Uh interesting. Very different leagues, very different countries. Um, something that I didn't realize, you know, before I lived there. China was very uh reflected of the NBA. So at that time, it was actually the, the first year I went there was like the 10th anniversary of the CBA. Um, and the, the Chinese basketball, there we go. Chinese basketball association. And, well, uh, you know, it was a very NBA type game. The rules were NBA type, uh, uh, you know, that well, it's kind of the league that Yao built. Yes. Right. I mean, he was the, you the, the big influence there. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, at that time, Yao was like still in Houston. So he was, you know, uh, the icon there, like he was, you know, the label of the league. And I think, you know, they took a lot of his experience and brought it back to that league. Um, Japanese league that I played in was very different. I played in two different leagues. So, uh, the first, first year I played in, it was Ison, Um, and that was that, that league was interesting because it developed just really from bragging rights. So the teams, I played for Ison, which is a, is a subsidiary company of Toyota. Uh, Toyota had a team. Hitachi had a team. So all these like mega brands out there. And I guess the way it started was they, um, you know, it was kind of like a company league, right? And it got more and more and more competitive. And they started, uh, you know, bringing in Americans, a higher level talent and one or two guys to come from other countries. And it just turned into like this super competitive, like almost for bragging like rights type league. Um, I played with J.R. Henderson, um, you know, from UCLA, also NBA guy. Um, uh, he played his whole career there. So he left the NBA, he played his whole career there. Um, beautiful country, beautiful league, beautiful lifestyle. 
you bounced around though, country to country. I don't think you spent more. When they're looking at your your career, I don't think you spent more than a couple of years in a row in one place. Did, was there ever a place where you thought I could? Like you mentioned JR being there for so long in Japan. Was there a place you thought I could, you know, put some roots down, or were you just always trying to get somewhere else? Um, yes and no. I think every it just kind of depended year to year. I think it just kind of unfolded that way. It wasn't necessarily the plan. Um, Japan, I would say, is one of them that I would I would have loved to stay at. Great for the family, you know, my firstborn. Sidon, you know, he went to, uh, he went to, uh, kindergarten out there, you know, so it was uh, a great experience. What happened was it was the year of the tsunami. So it was the earthquake. It was the year of tsunami. Um, and you were, in I was in Japan. I was in Tokyo. Yeah. When it happened. Yeah. That was, that was interesting. He said, all right. <laughs> well, I want to hear that story. Uh, that's a crazy story. So, uh. It was game day. We were in uh, we were in Tokyo, Shibuya Station, which is supposedly like the, if not one of the most busiest intersections in the in the world. Um, right in the middle of downtown, and so you know it was game day. I was taking a nap, uh, getting you know went to shoot around, shot, ate something, taking the nap, laying down, hanging, getting ready for the game, and. You know, the bed starts shaking. You know, we're in the hotel. The hotel room starts shaking and whatnot. And I'm from California, so I'm, you know, earthquake is an earthquake. Yeah, it used to. Be. Yeah. You know, Mother Nature, I'm never playing with Mother Nature, but earthquake is an earthquake. So, you know, it starts shaking. And, you know, so I'm like, whatever, I kind of roll over, go back to sleep. Are you in a high rise building? Yes, sir. Or how? I mean, it was at least wow. 80 floors. You know what I'm saying? And, and where were you? I was. Can't say exactly. I mean, I was on twenty something, twenty sixty. Like you know, I was, I was wow. something like that. And uh, you know, it started shaking, shaking, shaking. And you know, at this point, I'm like, I'm like, you know, hold on. So I open the, I open my door to ask Jr. You know, what are we doing? Right? He lived there his whole career. So I opened my door to see, like, hey man, what are we about to do? And uh, when I opened the door. Like all the cleaning ladies and hotel hotel attendants, people working there just start were like running for their life down the hall. So I was like, Yeah, so I threw my shoes on. You're thinking everybody's gonna think this is oh, this is a normal thing. Like everybody's calm. No, they're running. They're running. So you know, now it's been like it's a minute they're out of it. It's still shaking, right? Like and shaking, shaking, shaking. So, you know, we run we run to the stairs, we're running in the stairs and we're running, you know, down round and round and down the stairs and you know, at first we're like you know, I say we because it's like a group of us by now. It's like seven or eight of us by now. And, and by that, you know, we're kind of like jogging down the stairs and whatnot. And all of a sudden, I had my hand on the rail, and it like dipped down to like my shins and then like raised back up like over my head. And then I was like, yeah, this ain't no joke. So now we're going like, now I'm going like one, two steps and then jumping to the bottom. One, two steps, jump to the bottom. One, two steps, you know, we're going around like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get to the bottom. Uh, you know, go out into the intersection, and all you see are these high-rise buildings. I mean, it's just like being in New York. You see these high-rise buildings. You see the sky for a second, then the sky disappears and whatnot. Um, and that was the earthquake. And then, um, you know, it was it was chaos, a tsunami. Yeah, it was pure, pure chaos. It was pure chaos for that evening. Nobody really knew what was going on. Then you hear about water hit. In the north, you know, we had a couple of players from the north, and their families are there. You know, you're starting to hear that it's more and more serious. And uh, you know, I don't know what no tsunami is. You know, I had no idea anything about a tsunami. And then you start seeing pictures, and videos, and watching the news, and whatnot, and you see that it's you know it's real tragedy going on in the north. So, um. First couple of days was kind of weird trying to figure out what's going to happen, um, you know, with the tsunami, with the power plant, with the league, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, from there, they ended up canceling the league, but we stayed for like a week or two afterwards. I will say one of my best experiences playing overseas was 
going with the Red Cross to our, our local uh, <clears throat> train station in Nagoya. So my team was in Nagoya, hour and a half plane ride to, or uh, train ride, speed train to Tokyo. Um, and, you know, my team, our team went to, with Red Cross, we went there. And when I tell you, when I tell you, um, Chris, that they're, they were waiting in line to donate money to the North, right? This is, you know, the North is another two hours North of Tokyo, right? Literally standing in line. So this is like seven, eight in the morning, rush hour traffic, you know, people getting ready to shoot to Tokyo, you know, just like being in Manhattan, right? Um, everybody stopped. When I tell you 98, 99 out of 100 people stopped, it was literally a line that reached out of, outside of like the corridor and into the street of people waiting to donate money. And, um, you know, it was it, it, it was unbelievable. You know, it was it was unbelievable to see a whole nation, you know, what I'm saying coming together to do what's best for, for people that you, that you don't know, you know, and, and, you know, you saw kids with little piggy banks pouring out their whole piggy bank, all their change. You saw older people, younger people, um, business people, family people, you know, what well, you name it, everybody was out there donating for, for the North. So you see, you see the, you know, the, when, when tragedy strikes different areas, you see how people react. It gives you a real sense of, 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 of who they That's are. It. As a people. That's it. That's it. And, and just their overall character. You know, that was their character. Hey, you know, they're in need. We're going to help when they can. They would do it for us. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I was all, I mean, I was probably like 30 at the time. And, you know, that was uh, one of the biggest lessons I learned in my life. Wow. And, and I take it, you know, every day with me. So, you, you, I'm sure there were a lot of different coaching methods there, you know, in, in when you played overseas. Um, as opposed to what you might experience. How did that all shape your coaching style and, and the way you approach it now coming in as an assistant? Yeah, man, everywhere's different, man. You've been in your, you know, been in the NBA, so you've seen the different styles. Um, uh, you know, there's all different types of coaching, you know, different types of winning, this, that, and the other. Um, at the end of the day, was there somebody that stood out to you in that whole international scene that you were in that that uh, that you that you think back on? I mean, as either being really super tough or uh, incredibly influential on you. Um, I would say every country I went to is like I don't know. It sounds kind of like a cop out, but every country I went to, there's something that I learned. You know, whether it was um, Croatia, how we worked, how we worked in the preseason, preseason, and we, you know. Uh, developed to get ready uh, for the season or Italy, you know, we're running in mountains and around rivers and whatnot, you know, all to get in shape, um, you know, but the one thing, you know, the one common denominator of it all is good basketball, right? Good basketball is good basketball. Uh, I grew up watching basketball in the eighties and that's how, you know, that's what teams did. They played good basketball as a team, as a, as a full unit. Um, so, you know, in each country I went to, that was the challenge was to, um, you know, to, you know, build into the team, you know, find some type of synergy with the team. And it's like a, a whole new challenge. How can I win with this team? You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, ultimately that each one of those was a blessing, you know, because, you know, you had a different, team and it's why I played so many positions It's really why I played one through four was because it just depends on what this team needs. You know what I'm saying? And there's countries where I had to be the scorer. There's countries where I had to be the defender. There's countries where I just had to be a role player in Europe and set screens, roll, play good basketball, make the right pass, hit the right shots, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. And you're, you're, you know, you're, you're six, six. So I'd imagine different leagues. That's, that's, probably big for some leagues it's small for some leagues um was and it's it sounds like you're 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 just this whole hodgepodge you're just collecting right now when did coaching sort of jump into your it's funny man it's funny you ask that because i if you would have asked me you know in the middle of my career i'd have been like no nah, eggnog once i'm done with this basketball thing i'm done like 
I'm not going to do that. And and I really told you, like, there's never going to be an end of my basketball career. Like, I'm going to be playing this forever. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, as, as you as you get older and as you get closer to the end of my career. So what really happened with me was uh, when I was, I think, 32, I had my, well, I guess I was like 30, I had my first son. And, you know, I, I was, you know, had a long career at that point, And I was thinking about, you know, I, wa- I wanted to go out on top. I didn't want to be, you know, the broke down car still trying to run the race, you know, at the end of the day. So I wanted to go out on, you know, on my, when I wanted to go out. So um, what happened was I tore my Achilles. So I tore my Achilles when my son was like one that year, you know, and I didn't want to go out on that either. So I uh, rehabbed from that, and I ended up playing, you know, four or five years after that, which were probably the four or five best years of my career. Um, but to get back to your question, what happened was as I started getting older, and I guess probably in those five years, and really through the whole rehabilitation process with my Achilles, um, you know, going from walking to actually playing basketball again, um, you know, what happened was I started working out with younger kids, you know, and we do some of the drills I would do, you know, whether it was pick and roll reads or, you know, some catch and shoot stuff or finishing stuff. Um, and what happened, I, we, you know, we'd work before practice or after practice or in the off season on these things. I would see these kids use that move in the game, you know what I'm saying? And it worked, you know, and I felt just as good as if I had made the move on somebody, you know, and then that's when I started thinking, you know, maybe this coaching thing is for me, you know, yeah. Now, you, th- when you were rehabbing, were you in the United States, you tell this time, or is this somewhere, was it? I came home, I had surgery here um, from my big man from high school, Decker McKeever, put my, did my surgery. Actually, he was my, he, he played with me in, in high school, which is crazy. He did my, my surgery, I did my rehabilitation process uh, mostly at USC. Um, and yeah, that was a long process, man. Nine, nine months really. So I go back to play. and then you went back overseas. But but so when you saw when you saw the those kids you're talking about, that was in the United. That States. was both. You know that was not only during the my rehabilitation process, but really probably more during you know going back to play those next five years. You know what I'm saying? And being kind of an older guy and coming off an Achilles tear, which you know I'm trying to shake off dust. I'm trying to get healthy. I'm trying to get some explosiveness back, et cetera, et cetera. So just getting in reps. And reps and reps and reps and you know each each stop that I went to after that I would kind of take a young kid under my weight and be like hey man let's go get this working and then that's when that's when it happened and you know you see him you know hit hit a guy with a pick and roll read that we actually worked on and it it it, it was dope like a great experience yeah. so that was sort of the, the the out of you know sometimes we 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 experience things in our lives that we think are uh, a disaster at the time and the worst thing that could happen and it actually ends up sparking a flame that will now guide you through the rest of the day. I mean, you're, you think that that's the low point of your life is, you know, you get, you're playing overseas, you're, you blow your Achilles, you've always identified as a player and now out of that, all of a sudden coaching is bigger in you. Um, and now you found probably what you were, you, you know, like all due respect to these leagues in these other countries, but that was your path to the NBA. Yeah. And now you're in the NBA, yeah. but it doesn't happen right away. So you, you end by playing in Japan in 2015, mm-hmm. you joined the Nets in 2017. So what was going on in the interim? Uh, just took a year to just be me, hang with my family and, um, you were married at this time, and yeah, yeah, um, you, and we had, yeah, we we had all I had all three of my babies. Uh, they were little at the time, so were they all born in different countries? No, so they were all born at home, uh, but they all traveled to Japan. Uh, you know, my daughter Sydney would tell you that I was in China and I watched her be born on, I think it was Skype back then, on. Um, and I saw my other two sons born, so she's a little salty about that. But, you know, she's my one girl baby, so she's special anyway. So um, they were all born at home, but they were, uh, you know, we, we all lived together in Japan, so they experienced that, t- that, that time together. But 
So, so you had, were there other odd jobs between before you got to be a coach? Not necessarily. I mean, I kind of, you know, I was in, went back to Orange County and it kind of uh, just got my life together, spend time with yeah. family, friends, catch up, do things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do during the season and whatnot. Um, and figure out the next move. And then figure out the next move, um, you know, which I did, was, didn't really know it was going to be basketball. I ended up just going to the summer league for – uh, to watch some of the young guys that I worked out with back home play. Um, and uh, ended up running into a million people that I know, you know, and start conversations and start catching up with people and whatnot. And, um, you know, this opportunity was born out of that. How did it, How did the Nets connection come about? Uh, so Sean Marks, Cal guy. I know, I know him as Kiwi. Y'all know him as Sean Marks. I know him as Kiwi. Like, he was a monster in college. Dunking on people and running people over. Rick Gane, he was a monster, you know. Uh, a little bit older than you, right? You, like, you came in. A little so I was in high school. So I was in high school. But, you know, those teams were, were really good. With Al Grisby and, and those guys. I mean, those teams were yeah. monster. Tony Gonzalez, like, those teams were, were a monster. And part of the reason why I went to college again, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I knew him from back then. We had worked out together. We had the same agent for for a little bit of time, so we we had worked out together in the off season, a couple of years, and whatnot. Um, and that time he was with the Spurs, um, and we just kind of reconnected and kept the conversation going. And um, it turned into an opportunity in Brooklyn. So, and it was a, you know you're you're you kind of come in at a low level, and you're you know you're just trying to do whatever you had to do video player development. Um, I would imagine for somebody embarking on their, their coaching journey, though, that was the perfect thing. Absolutely. It's part of the process. Man. So, like, you don't realize it, but, like, you know, you don't just jump into coaching, right? Like, coaching is really teaching at the end of the day, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, if you're going to be a teacher, there's preparations that you have to have to be a teacher, you know? And um, it's, you know, that's why I love coaching because that's the challenge, right? Like, anything that uh, I couldn't figure out X and O wise when I was playing, I could make up for physically by being 6'6 and being a point guard or shooting guard or whatever. Coaching is 100 and zero. So it's all teaching and trying to help somebody else execute or be the best they can be. Um, and that's teaching at the end of the day. So I think all those steps along the way, uh, you know, help me, improve my coach's vo voice, help me, help me teach at the end of the day, help me share, help other people understand. And most of all, just helps to put stuff in perspective from, from my angle. You know, I've been playing my whole career, worried about how I can help a team. You know, now, now, um, it's more about, you know, how can you collaborate and build synergy with guys that have very different experiences in this sport and in life in general. Um, how can you take all of these different experiences, you know, wrap them into one and all row in the same direction? You know? and, and you're, you kind of found yourself in a, in a position, um, that, that didn't exist in the NBA a, f a few years ago in terms of all the teams have now G league affiliates. And, you know, there's that back and forth between players and that synergy between the G league and the NBA teams. You kind of were the guy that um, it, you worked with those players who were going back and forth. Yes. And it, it, it kind of, it, you're in that player development. You're, you're discovering young talent. You're trying to b breed that young talent. And one of those guys that was on the, the Long Island Brooklyn shuttle for a while there when he's a young player is Nick Claxton. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine it gave you sort of a, of a unique bond with Nick, uh, what did you see in Nick as sort of that young gazelle coming into and, and, and his time in the G League and what that did for him? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, maybe Nick was, was, you know, first of all, when we drafted Nick, like the draft room went crazy, you know what I'm saying? And, um, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was great to see that. Right. But, you know, first thing that stood out to me with Nick was just how skilled he was at everything. 
he was good at everything, you know. Um, I always talk about like a tool belt as a player, you know what I'm saying? He had two on it, you know, tools. When, when I came through in 80s, 90s basketball, you had like one or two or three tools, and you would just mastered those tools, and, and you know, that's what you ran with. I mean, this kid came in and had like 12, 13, 14 tools on it on his belt. And I was like, you can do all that. You can dribble and handle and pass and do all that. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you get to know him, you know, you know that, you know, he played guard when he was younger and he was smaller and then he hit a, a growing spurt and then, you know, started playing, you know, as a big. And so, you know, along his journey, along his path, he developed so many different tools, you know? So I think the challenge with Nick was, first of all, he was super young coming out of school, you know, still a teenager basically. Um, and, you know, one thing is, you know, nowadays with so much, you know, with social media and, you know, all these different coaches, trainers, all this other stuff going on, um, it kind of gets blurry sometimes, I think, you know, uh, a lot of these kids do a lot of sk skill work and they know, you know, they, they, they end up having so many different tools, but then they don't always know when to use it, when and where to use it, you know, how to apply them, you know what I'm saying? And so... I always can, you know, I always compare it to a construction job, right? Like if you had a screw, you wouldn't like bust out your hammer to screw your screw in, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, and so it was, the challenge for us was trying to connect those things. You know what I'm saying? When do I get my hammer out? When do I get my sandpaper out? When do I get my wrench out? What not, you know what I'm saying? And um, that's been our journey. That's been our challenge and respect to him because he keeps digging into him and just trying to master it one by one by one by one. Yeah. And he, and he, and when I, you know, I remember last year or the year before when he just started to, you know, really improve. And I talked to him after a game on the air, we do an interview and said, you know, who's the guy, who's your, who's your guy. And he's like, well, Ryan forehand Kelly, man, that guy is the guy that brought it out of me. And, uh, you've been a, you've been a big part of his journey. And just to see a player jump, like he did from, you know, last off season and have the kind of year that he had this past year. Um, it, it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. Not just you, you talk about tools and young players have tools, but when you're a developmental coach and you're trying to develop players, I would imagine from even a star player to a young player, uh, there's a lot more to it than just the tools. You know, the, the physical tools. There's got to be something that clicks in these guys as well. And I imagine you, you kind of take a holistic approach to it, right? Not just, not just physical, but their mental aspect, their professionalism, their work ethic, the kind of person they are, how they treat everybody around them. Is that all going into your development of a young player? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you talk about a young player like it's basketball is fun. It's all good, but, you know, there's a life thing, too. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, it's kind of in tandem. You know, we're trying to – I'm trying to share and, you know, share my experience and, and my knowledge in life and in this game with you, you know. And in doing that, you know, there's a certain relationship that goes into it, right? Like, we got to be able to communicate, be able to listen, talk to each other, um, um, collaborate, you know, set goals, and then and then go reach them. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, cheers to Nick. You know, we kind of built that relationship. You know, it's first thing I always want to do. Like, I, wanna, I don't ever want to, uh, you know, tell you how to play or this, that, or the other. I just want to share my, my, my experience and my knowledge of this game with you. And you take your knowledge and experience of this game and let's collaborate and let's put it down and let's execute it and see how high, you know, how, how far that takes it. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, the beginning of that process is creating a relationship, you know, getting to know each, each other, what each other is about, um, who you're about, what their family about. And this kid, this kid came in with, you know, a great family, great support system behind him, um, great foundation in this thing. Um, so yeah, you know, it was, it was a unique experience. It seems like it's been 20 years that we've been on this road, but Respect to how far, that's just respect to how far he's come in this few years that we've been been cracking at it. And last thing I would say is, you know, I'm not going to take the the credit for that. Like, he's done the work, and he's put the people around him to help him do that work. Um, so, you know, it's a organizational thing, 
it's a family thing, the people from his neighborhood, from his school, people that he worked out with in high school, um, in college, et cetera, et cetera. It's collaboration in totality. Um, curious, the, the, the mechanics, Ryan, of, of how you, the, the, we, people watch on TV, they see, and this has changed a lot over the years. I, I, you know, when I came in the league, there were three assistant coaches, you know, and one video guy was back in lock. Now there are, there's a whole row in the first row of assistant coaches and the second row. You've been in the second row. Um, it, what is the approach you take during a game? Will you talk to players? Do you just, if you see something, you say something? Are there, do you have to uh, avoid too many voices talking to guys? I'm just curious of the, of what it's like to be in that second row as an assistant. Yeah, we we all have different duties, right? Like it's kind of broken up. I mean, whether it be um, tracking fouls, cop, you know, uh, you know, tracking, uh, you know, opponent calls, what, whatever it is, um, you know, uh, video replay, whatever it is, right? There's like all these different things that in game things that are kind of divided up amongst the staff. So we all kind of have our own duties and whatnot. Um, that's part of it. Um, you know, uh, the other part, you know, in, in terms of talking to players, like we all talk to all the players, you know what I'm saying? Maybe some of us talk to certain players more about screening or rebounding or defending. Um, and, you know, other coaches talk to other players about, you know, shooting or, you know, execution of offense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it kind of it kind of goes in in tandem with what your duty is, if that makes sense. So um, that's kind of my role during the game is to hold hold the standard of the duties that I'm in charge of. And uh, the 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 iPad is pressure, right? The, uh, when when there's a questionable call and Jacques Wall turns and looks at you guys. You got to have an answer right away. It's tricky, man. Uh, that one's that one's scary. It's tricky. You never know how they're gonna, you know, how they're gonna unfold. It it almost seems like the ones that are like guarantee this one's gonna get turned back turned over, are the ones that don't get, and vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's a perfect example of just a duty in game duty. You know, you got to be on top of it. You know, and you get better at it as you go along. And, you know, you get better in that example. You get better at it. what is questionable. You know, what should we fight for? What shouldn't we fight for? And it's quite frankly, it's a new rule, so it's not just on that one person. It's on all of us. You know, to kind of figure out, hey, when in the game are we going to use this, and how do we want to use it, and why do we use it, et cetera, et cetera. So. It's amazing to watch all you guys now because there are, like we mentioned, there used to be a time where there were just a, you know three assistant coaches. Now, now it's almost like the coaching staff is a team in itself. Absolutely. I mean, you have you have player, you know, guys like you. Uh, you've got some younger guys who are former players that are just there to work out guys, and it's like you have a you have a you have a team in itself that's got a that goes into battle um, in practice in warm ups. Um, it's changed a lot. Do you still, is it a, is it a physically taxing job for you at 42 years old or 43 years old? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's definitely physically taxing, but it also keeps you in shape. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, we're doing a lot of physical stuff, but I mean, you know, that's doing while, while we can. So, um, blessed to be doing that, you know, I, I think also going to your point of just how many, uh, resources are here, you know, I think that's what makes our organization special is, you know, is the culture of how many people are, are involved in investing in these kids and helping them reach their full potential, whether that's front office, coaching staff, performance, uh, analytics, uh, you know, you name it. Like there's so many different things. There's so many different resources that are on hand for these guys. You know, and, um, you know, I think that's what makes us special. And you got to stay enthusiastic throughout it all. I mean, through the, the late nights and the travel, and it's just keeping these guys up, right, and keeping them focused on what they can Yeah, it's a game of challenges, man. You know, it's, it's like life. It's a reflection of life. It's just a game of challenges. You know, you, um, you, know, you take a challenge, you win it or lose it, and you learn it, you learn from it, and then you you move on, you know, and so 
you know, I always compare this thing to like math, you know, it's like a math, you know, a bunch of a series of math equations. You know what I'm saying? Like you just go by one by one and you figure out this answer. And then you go to the next one, figure out that answer. And, you know, in our challenges comes, you know, the, you know, collaboration in doing that, you know what I'm saying? So whether that's one player and one coach, whether that's a uh, coaching staff and a team, whether that's a performance staff in the team, whatever it is, you know, the, the faster you can collaborate and use your knowledge and experience um, in solving that equation, the faster you can move on to the next one. And the faster you stack these equations up, the further out ahead you get in this very competitive bit. Jacques Vaughn, you, you've had a number of years now to work under Jacques as a as an assistant when he was there. Now he's the head coach. Um, what has been the thing that has stood out to you the most about your time with Jacques? Um, you know, his dedication, his determination, his resilience. You know, a very competitive man, very competitive. I mean, you know that from when he played and you know, he takes that same energy into coaching, you know, um, the first year, uh, I was actually on the staff was really in the bubble. Um, and that was with, uh, JV as, as the leader, you know, captain of the boat. And that was a weird ship. That was a weird ship to be on, right? Like, plan. To be in the bubble and everything that's going on, man, going on in the world and in the league and what, you know, with our team, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, just his dedication, to this whole thing, to this team, to, you know, to the team winning, um, his determination in, in, in helping these guys be the best they can be. And then, you know, I say resilience because he's never wavered. His, his character has never wavered through everything that we've been through as an organization, everything, you know, whether you win a game, lose a game, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I guess the one thing that stands out to me is just watching him develop Karis, Karis LeVert. Right when we first got him, and you know um, how meticulous he was in planning for the workouts, and uh, how focused he was in building his tool belt, and what tools need to come first, and when and where to you know when and where to use these tools, teaching him those things. Um, and so you know I was blessed to just be rebounding for him sometimes, you know what I'm saying? And just hear the conversation between those guys or, you know, being token defense or whatever, you know? So early on, it was a blessing just seeing how he operates, how he teaches. Um, and, you know, a lot of those things I still use. Yeah. And is know, it, with, I guess when my guys the now. higher you get up, the less of that you end up doing. But the influence you have on your other coaches and your younger coaches is really where the legacy is for those guys. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And you, your character speaks for itself, you know what I'm saying, just in life. So, you know, the way you carry yourself is going to tell you who you are, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, character is one of the biggest things I respect about JV. Like I said, you know, in terms of his character never wavering, wavering you know what I'm saying? That lets you know that, you know, this yeah, what is a was that, man, solid he person right bamboo here. Plant. He, had the, he had a bamboo plant that you took to Orlando, right, in the bubble. What was the, the metaphor they used for that? So, 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 you know, yeah. JV's a cerebral brother too now. You know what I'm saying? Kansas got no, tell you know, like, J-Hop pass. You know what I'm saying? You know. Uh, cool. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's but cerebral. Point guard. You know what I'm saying? All of the above. You know, cerebral. So, you know, it was interesting because, you know, part of teaching, right, is, 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 is communication, right? And it's a two-way street. You know, you got to listen and, and it, you know, you got to, um, you also got to, you know, communicate and so you know the thought behind the bamboo was bamboo um bamboo you know will bend but won't break right that's what makes it unique so you can bend it you know it's malleable enough to bend into the shape that you want it to bend but then it's strong enough to not break when it gets there you know what i'm saying or not get brittle etc cetera, etc cetera. and so um you know, overall, in short, that was kind of the theme of that. You know what I'm saying? It was like a little uh, mascot. And yeah. carried it around. Yeah. Carried it around. It was that important to us. You know what I'm saying? And respect because, you know, that's kind of how that team was built. You know, we had some roster guys. We had some guys that weren't on our roster. 
We had some guys that played a lot. We had some guys that didn't play at all, you know, in the beginning of the season. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, the the thought of that bamboo, you know what I'm saying, um, really kind of, you know, our, our, our team kind of reflected that. We were strong and we were going to compete and we were going to put it all on the line and have no regrets and we're going to see what happens in the end. Yeah. And yeah. we did that. And positive we information, putting it in the mind of your player, something to think about that always has their sort of their course correct. You know, your North Star, you see that thing as a representative of that. That's a big part of what coaching okay. is. Um, you know, we get caught up sometimes in the X's and O's, but it's about bigger. It's about motivating people. And I, and I think you're, you're a great motivator That's of right. people, Ryan, for and Kelly. Um, I, and I, I'm glad people have got to <laughs> know your, your story you. here and your journey. It's, uh, it's a circuitous route to where you are in Brooklyn right now. I, I like to end these things, but just a little glimpse into somebody in their persona, um, the, the, the great yeah. coach Jim Valbano had that memorable speech at the ESPYs, the never give up speech. And he said to do, have a, have a full day. You need to do three oh, things man. every day. Um, one is laugh. Yeah. The other is, is cry, but in a way of, you know, have your emotions moved and the other is think. So if we, uh, if we go with the, the laugh part first, what recently or in general makes you laugh, Ryan Forehand Kelly? Whoa, that's a good challenge. I don't laugh much. I'm kind of like a grumpy guy, so I don't laugh. No, nah, I'm just playing. Nah, I laugh all the time. Um, that's a good question. What makes you laugh? Played, play with? played with in your journey you know, throughout the world? I don't know. Uh, f funniest, f funniest player. That's a good question. You know, Guy Shamgar is a funny dude. New York guy, cause, cause yeah, we played, we played together in Croatia actually. So, um, you know, we had always played against each other in China and always battled and whatnot. And then we became teammates. Um, uh, but he one of the funnier dudes I know cause he a New York brother. He don't talk much, but when he gets to talking, you know, he gets to talking then you know, he starts getting funny, man, you know, so. Uh, I would say I would say sham God, but you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, laughing wise, you know, I think just things that make my make me smile, man. Growth, you know what I'm saying. I see my kids, the you know, developing now. They're playing basketball, baseball, lacrosse. Daughter's playing volleyball, stuff like that, man. Just seeing them get better day to day and competing and. Getting knocked down and then getting back up and then doing it again and then learning from it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go back to God, Sham the, God. Those would be the teach things. you the Sham God when you're playing together. <laughs> you know, my handle was all right. You know what I'm saying? But it was more basic. You know, it's more like back you down, like on some Magic yeah. Johnson, Sam Cassell type thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, Sam was like, you know, bop, bop, you know, all that stuff. So I didn't ask him for the Sham God. Yeah, you will on every once in a while. That that was I didn't really need that tool on my belt. No. Yeah, I didn't need that tool on my belt. You know what I'm saying? But um, it's something I use now when these young punks try to try to try me. You know, and we get on the court. You know, and you're talking crazy. All right, I'm hit you with this sham guy, big man. Yeah, people don't know. Yeah, yeah, I get to my level. To describe it over the years on the air, because you see it every once in a while, where guys, you know, you handle it with your right hand, you kind of go like you're crossing over, but then you pull it back with the same hand, right? That how you describe it. Yeah, and. And, and yeah, exactly. And and think about like the time, like that 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 Sham God move traveled yeah. all around the world, right? And there was no social media, and it wasn't on the news and whatnot. But we were in California. Yeah. They were in California trying Sham God. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, respect to Sham because There's a Sham made it work. Because Sham was a beast. On the internet about the origin of the Sham God too, because there was a player at Penn. Um, that did it in an NCAA tournament game, and they he he's he claim you know they claim that he was the originator, and then I don't know, but anyway, we we digress <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, sure, yeah. Shout out, shout out, Sham God, uh, God Sham God, man, because he made it work. He made it a real move, and and and, uh, and he had the, he actually used to use it. it was great, all time great moves, and one of the all time great names in in basketball history. God Sham God. There we go. Yeah, and, and he's one of the all-time great people, man. So, win, win, win. Good. 
Um, the the yeah. the the yeah. funny the 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 cry yeah. part. Not necessarily something in a sad way, but something that moves you can easily move you to uh, to to feel your emotions or something recently that's you, you know when you you went. You know, when you get older, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. start to get a little more teary-eyed over stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's at least my experience. You know? um, so, you know, I don't know if I really shed a tear, but there's been times where, you know, you kind of get, get, get ready to shed a tear when you see some of these guys achieve the things, you know, that they've been working so hard for. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I don't know if I have an example off the top of my head, but I, you know, that that achievement, you know, just to watch somebody work so hard and and and, and build and build and build and get knocked down and get it back up and then actually achieve it, like that's, that's as a coach, that's special, right? Uh, Bingo. Think part, just you know, you got the Oculus outside Barclays Center. Everybody comes up through the subway, walking around that neighborhood, coming in, tens of thousands of people coming into that building every, you know, for an event. Um, if you could put something on that Oculus, just a message or something you wanted people to think about, is there a, a, maybe something that you live by that you would put up there for everybody to see? You know, uh, that's a good question. You know, these last, you know, five years of life, right? Like from from my vantage point, right? Like one thing that stands out to me and a term that I use often is uh, just to share, you know, like share with one another, you know, um, I feel like, uh, we said it earlier, like just when we collaborate at things, you know, when a group of people collaborate at something, it's, it's that, that much strong, more strong, that much stronger when we collaborate, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, share would be my thing. We need to share with each other, you know what I'm saying? Whether, that's how to do something, when to do something, why to do something. Um, you know, that's kind of been my, that's kind of the thing that st stood out to me. Share with one another, and then that's how we learn, and that's how we move forward. That's how we do a little book once. Get time. better. Everything grow. Everything we needed to learn, we learned in kindergarten. And what do I think about when you're in kindergarten, right? They want you to share. Share your stuff. That's a great message. There you go. There you go. So I'm not so far off there. There's no wrong. So answer. far off with that. I thought maybe I was crazy thinking that, Brent. I'm not so far off. No. Yeah, but... kindergarten level. Kindergarten. We hey, was... worked in kindergarten, and I'll take you know everybody. We life gets complicated as we get older, and there's so many more things in level. But it, yeah, like they say, if you wanna you wanna be able to understand something, be able to teach it to a five year old, right? And and that's the that's the Big key. Up. And you know we we get. Very, uh, yeah, we get elaborate with things, but it's, yeah, little little simple messages like share um, can help you whether or not you're at the uh, kindergarten table or you're in the the locker room of an NBA team. So, Or on the basketball court. I was going to say the same thing, you know, just simplifying stuff. You know what I'm saying? The game's got so complicated and whatnot. It's the same simple game, you know? So simplifying stuff uh, is something that we, Ryan, we try Ryan to do Kelly. here, too. One of my favorite people in that organization. I'm glad. I'm glad people got a chance to uh, to get to know you a little bit here. And thank you so much my for man. coming on the podcast. Hey man, it's an honor. It's an honor. Uh, it's funny you say that because every time I see you, I feel the same way. You know, I I, I want to have a conversation, and I probably bug you too much. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it's always an honor. It's always an honor uh, to talk to you, and it's. Uh, each conversation gets better. I think that's why. That's why I keep coming back. So I'll be back next time we see you. I'm going to walk up on you and talk to you. <laughs> I look forward to it, RFK. Thanks, buddy.